Well, first, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Petra Illick. Um, most of you all have heard me talk about her quite a bit uh, at lunches and things like that. Uh, Dr. Illick is a medical doctor in Anchorage, okay, and she is the one that came up with the idea of growing rhodiola as a crop in Alaska. And so had it not been for her brainstorming on this, we wouldn't be where we're at today. Uh, and as you all know, we're growing rhodiola out here in the farm to do research on it. Uh, so those of you all that haven't met Petra, uh, please introduce yourself but anyway. Thank you for bringing uh, Matab up today. And I'm going to let Petra uh, introduce herself and introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Steve. Come on in. Hi. Hi. I'm here to see Julia. I see you, Julia. Anyway, thanks, Steve, and everybody for um, coming here today on a Monday afternoon. Um, like Steve said, we started the Rhodiola Project. Um, I first had the idea in about 2008 after reading a science news article on the medicinal benefits of it and the fact that it grows in Arctic and subarctic regions in circumpolar worlds, uh, circumpolar parts of the world. And I had this idea of possibly introducing it to growers in Alaska um, who seem to struggle growing food crops that don't like to necessarily grow here. And I thought here's a plant that could potentially have a high economic stream to the agriculture community uh, because we could actually use it um, uh, it take advantage of the Alaskan harsh winter to grow this plant because that's kind of what it likes. So we started the co-op and about two years ago, maybe it's been three, two, whenever you publish your article, I ran across uh, an article in just the standard lay media press about uh, this professor at UC Irvine who had a fruit fly lab and was doing anti-aging research and she discovered that um, rhodiola extract increases the lifespan of the fruit fly by almost 25 percent without side effects and I thought great and I told Steve about this and his first quip was why would I want fruit flies to live 25 percent longer <laughs> I mean, nuisance. and of course he got the message right away so I googled uh, Dr. Jafari and um, sent her an email and she was um, kind enough to respond and over the course of the next couple of years we talked on the phone and emailed back and forth about rhodiola and she was telling me more about her research and it was very exciting and even though she's been doing this research for about 10 years she'd never really seen a field of rhodiola so I said come on up and so here she is and I'm delighted um, uh, Dr. Jafari is uh, with the Department of uh, Pharmacology at UC Irvine has a lot of clinical experience, has a lot of laboratory experience, teaches, uh, does uh, a ton of research. Um, and she is uh, basically a world expert on the physiological effects in the laboratory uh, and trying to deduce some of the chemical, uh, the chemical uh, consequences and pathways of, of rhodiola. So without any more um, introduction, I'll let her give her talk, Dr. Jafari. Thank you. By the way, I have a little notebook going around, if you don't mind uh, letting me know your name and if you want to give me contact information, just so I know who is here and if you have any further interest, um, I think you can stay in touch. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Ely, for that kind introduction and Dr. Brown for um, inviting me. Um, Believe it or not, I really, really feel honored to be here and present a summary of 10 years of research with Rhodiola rosea. And as uh, Dr. Ely mentioned, I had never actually touched a Rhodiola plant in my life until yesterday or until two days ago. Um, so without more introductions, I started talking. So I will be mostly talking about Rhodiola rosea, and as I said, I'm summarizing uh, my research with this plant. But what I do in my lab, my fruit fly lab, is the, the focus on the lab is not rhodiola rosea, and I'm going to tell you how I ended up working with rhodiola rosea, but I do anti-aging research. The focus of my lab is to increase the lifespan and improve health. So my goal, my research goal, is not to add years to our lives, it's to add healthy years. So having said that, this is how we age. So this is our 20s, 40s, 
um, 80s, and then this is uh, Madame Jean Canouan, who passed away when she was 122 years old. So here she's celebrating her 121st uh, birthday, and she still looks very cute. She was very active, riding her bike, bicycle, until uh, um, the end of her life. And um, when you look at this picture, you may say that, well, the goal of an anti-aging lab or lifespan extension is to go through this process 20, 40, 80, and then when you're 100, this is how you are. But this is not what my goal is. My goal is for us to go through this process and really um, <laughs> do that when you're 100. So that means that we are getting older, but we are very healthy, and we are enjoying a very good health span. So that is the disclaimer for my research. And you maybe may say that, well, it's really hard to achieve that because um, how, how could we reach that? How could we have the health span that we all you know, hope to have? But there are some amazing uh, examples of exceptional lifespans in the nature. The Bristol uh, cone pine um, that you see here lives up to 5,000 years you have a species of jellyfish that is immortal. They don't die. So nature has definitely some examples of exceptional lifespans and even an example of immortality. And then, of course, when it comes to humans, we may not go live up to 200,000 years or be immortal. I don't know. Maybe one day we will. <laughs> I don't know. But um, this was the cover of Time magazine a few months ago that uh, the babies who are born today, they have the potential to live up to 142 years. And who knows, maybe 10 years from now, there will be a picture on the Time magazine with 200 years old. We don't know. But we, as um, an organism, we do have the potential to live longer and longer. And the question is how? And this is hopefully my lab and some other labs uh, around the country. I'm not the only person who does anti-aging research. We are trying to tackle that uh, question. So to me, aging is not increasing the number. Aging is pretty much disease. Because as we age, the risk of developing some of the diseases that you see on this slide increases. We are going to have a higher chance of having cancer, cardiovascular diseases, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So these are all diseases of aging. And the goal is to slow the aging process so that you enjoy a life up to, well, maybe this graph goes further here, up to 200, and be disease free. So this is really the ultimate goal. And if you look at the aging research for the past, I would say, two or three decades, we have focused on lifespan extension. So you see a lot of examples of papers and publications on modulation of lifespan pathways so that the model species that that scientist is working with lives longer. So you have a number of examples on lifespan extension in worms, in fruit flies, in yeast, in mice, and the focus has been mostly on lifespan. And one of the, uh, some of the pathways that have been targeted for the lifespan extension are listed here, and I'm going to talk about them more. But if we look at the healthcare costs, majority of, majority of healthcare costs happen at later age, later time in life. As I showed you in the in this in the previous graph, they happen after the age of 60, 70, and as we approach uh, 80. And the chances of having Alzheimer's disease or any type of cancer after the age of 80 is pretty high. So the goal of the aging research should not be just to increase the lifespan; should be also to focus on health span. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And wh how I define health span is a healthy lifespan. So up to not too long ago, as I said, the focus was on lifespan extension. And finally, this paper was published this year in PNAS, suggesting that rather than just focusing on chronological aging, we should also focus on health span. So they went back and they looked at four different forms mutated worms, so this is the DAP, this is CLP, and I'm not going to bore you um, explaining what these mutations are, but these are mutated worms, one mutation, one gene, caused them to live longer. And everybody was very excited, we saw a number of publications. And then finally somebody went back and looked at them, the authors of this uh, paper, the co-authors, they looked at these worms and they said, wait a minute, compared to the wild type, or the control, if you look at the percent survival, yes, they live longer, so they have 
So this is your DAF2, which was a paper that created a lot of noise in the media and in the scientific community because the DAF2 worms live so much longer compared to the control. But then they went back and they look at the health span of these worms and they figure out that, yes, they live longer, but their, their health span is compromised. And in warm term, health span is not, you can ask them, are you happy? Do you feel good? <laughs> um, they just move less. So you look at their medium, their environment, they're moving less, they, they look, they don't look healthy. So then they went back and looked at all these other mutants and said, wait a minute, yes, they live longer, but they are not healthy. So again, the focus should be on extending the lifespan and improving the health span. And this is where I came from in 2005. So as Dr. Illig mentioned, I, I'm a clinical researcher. Up to 2005, my, the research that I did focused on diseases of aging. So I was doing cardiovascular pharmacotherapy. Um, I joined a pharmaceutical company for three years and I do, did a lot of neurological um, disease research. And then when I came back to UCI in 2005, it was sort of those experiences that apple fell from the tree. And I said, wait a minute, all these diseases fell under the big umbrella of aging. So how about rather than focusing on cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, how about if we try to slow the aging process? Because by slowing the aging process, we are going to slow the progression of these uh, diseases. So I started an anti-aging pharmacology lab. So this is what we call ourselves. And we started um, identifying compounds or botanical extracts that would extend the lifespan, improve the health span, and then eventually we needed to find out what is their mechanism of action. And then after these three steps, of course the fourth one is to identify active compounds. And I will talk a little bit about some of the future work that I'm hoping to do with the clinical applications and clinical research. So in a nutshell, this, is, this has been my research for the past 10 years. So what we did is that we, I sat down and I said, well, I work with humans. I'm a clinical researcher. But I can't do lifespan studies in humans. We just live too long. I mean, by the time I finish a lifespan study and the paper is published, I'm gone. Uh, myself. So I started looking at model species. I looked at yeast, I looked at worms, some of the premier model species that we, use in, we have been using in aging research. And I came across fruit flies. And I decided to choose Drosophila melanogaster, or the fruit fly, as my model system. Why? Because they are very inexpensive, they are short lived. And what we did over the past uh, years, we developed we derived another population from um, one of my colleagues' uh, fruit fly population, Dr. Michael Rose's lab, and my students call them J flies, and maybe you can have a lucky guess what J um, stands for. I'm not going to say that because we are taping. Um, and we, I recognize that they have very powerful genetics. Uh, the genome of the fruit fly is sequenced, so we can we have the privilege of working with different mutations and different mutant lines. And there are multiple disease models. So you have a fruit fly model that has Alzheimer's disease. They, we have cancer, we have Parkinson's model. And we share many of our disease genes with fruit flies. We share about 70% of our disease genes with fruit flies. So if you think about it, we are maybe, fruit flies are maybe little humans because we share so <laughs> And then the good news when it comes to aging research is that we share common aging pathways. They share common aging pathways with humans and I'm going to talk about them. So if you look at this diagram, this was published in Science five years ago. This is the dietary restriction pathway in a fruit fly and this is mammal. And if I cover flies and mammals, many proteins <coughs> and genes and pathways that you see here from TOR to AKT, you name it, FOX, so they are preserved. They're conserved. So you see the same pathways in a fly that you would see in a human. And then, um, fruit flies behave just like us. So maybe I should say, we behave like fruit flies. <laughs> so now I'm going to ask you a question, and hopefully by the end of uh, the next two minutes, you're convinced that I picked the right model system to do my aging research. So do you know what male flies do when they get rejected by female flies? 
That's a good one. I have to test that. <laughs> what else? What do you think a male fly does when they get rejected by a female? Go we'll we'll find another female. Go we'll find another female. No. This is what they do. Yeah, <laughs> 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 well, that, is that what you yeah. I wish I had a prize, but I, I don't. So this is what a male fruit fly does. When they get rejected by a female fly, and this is not a joke, this is, this is a scientific publication. That was published in 2012 in Science, and then New York Times at the time wrote a full-blown article on this study. So when male flies get rejected by female flies, they give them two options, alcohol or food. And they all go for the alcohol. So they go and get drunk. And as you can see, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but this is the alcohol preference, and this is what they do. They, they go and reach for alcohol. So forget about the genes, forget about how great they are as a model system. They behave like humans, or again, maybe we behave like um, fruit flies. So hopefully by now I have convinced you all that fruit flies, Drosophila, is a very good model system to study aging. So then we started this process. So then we started to develop an algorithm or a, or a screening algorithm to find out what are some of the compounds and extracts that would extend the lifespan, but not at the expense of health, and also improve health. So we started with, uh, so this number is about 90 right now. So we started with 90 compounds and extracts. And people ask me, how did you come up with that list? And as a clinician or as a clinical researcher, I didn't pick compounds that I wouldn't take as a human. So if something had too many side effects, I wouldn't even subject it to this algorithm. And I will share with you some of the concerns that I have with some of the current ongoing research, because unfortunately this minor issue is not really being addressed. And we still test for compounds and extracts, not botanical extracts, so I would say pharmaceuticals that are pretty toxic. So we started this algorithm assay, and of course, the first test was a mortality assay or a longevity assay. We wanted to make sure that the lifespan is increased. But we didn't stop here. Because if I had stopped here, I would say almost 25 or 30 percent of what I started with did really great. We continued for checking, we checking for reproduction, for the nervous system, and for health span markers. And when we continued our nervous system, the impact of the compound on the nervous system, and then we finished this algorithm, this is what we end up with. So at the end of, I would say, a few years of screening, we ended up recognizing that, we, we ended up identifying cinnamon, rhodiola rosea, curcumin, green tea, rosadamacin, and pyelidodon. And green tea, I, I have the, um, picture here, but green tea had some problems, and at the end of my talk, hopefully I have time to sh show you what those problems are. But this is what we found out. And um, the very first plant that went very successfully through this algorithmic pathway was rhodiola rosea. So if you ask my colleagues or um, other colleagues outside the university, what is the expertise of my lab, they would say rhodiola rosea. So I have reviewed papers. Uh, grants on rhodiola rosea <coughs> because I think my lab is establishing itself as really a rhodiola rosea um, research lab, and I'm going to show you why. So this is it. So this is this picture is not from a rhodiola rosea from Alaska. I wish I had done that, but you see another picture of rhodiola. So this is in Altai Mountains. This is where rhodiola is mostly grown, Arctic regions, and of course this audience is not the audience who talk about the agriculture. You know more than I do about um, agriculture with rhodiola rosea. But the rhodiola rosea that I have been using in my lab came from Swedish Herbal Institute. Um, they standardize it to 3% rosebins and 1% cedidroside. I have tested other rhodiola rosea extracts in my lab with various concentrations of rosebins and cedidroside, and this is the best. The 3%, 1%. Is the combination that gives me what you're going to see in the upcoming slide. And these are some of the putative active compounds in rhodiola rosea. So these are the rosavine, rosavine, rosin, and rosary. And this is the salidroside. And this is the root. And we get we work with the extract. So what my fruit flies consume, what we give them as a compound or as an extract, is what you see here. 
not the not the uh, uh, not the root. And this is what we have seen consistently with rhodiolorosia. So if you expose fruit flies and you put rhodiolorosia extract in their food, you will see a 25% extension in their lifespan in both males and females. We published our first rhodiola paper in 2007, and after that paper was published, other people around the world started looking at lifespan extension with rhodiolorosia. And you see papers on lifespan extension in worms, in uh, snails, and I believe one paper in yeast. And we replicated the yeast data in my lab because I was pretty much shocked um, with that. So what the good news with this statement and the lifespan of other species is that the pathways that rhodiola is targeting in a fruit fly, these are the pathways that have been conserved from species to spe species, from yeast to worms to fruit flies. So this was really the good news. And then we published other papers with rhodiola rosea. <coughs> so I will be presenting some published data on rhodiola and some um, unpublished data. So this was great. We found out that rhodiola rosea <coughs> extended the lifespan. But remember the algorithm and those assays? So then we subjected everything that you saw, you see on this slide, like the lifespan extension experiments. We, we, we repeated all the health span assays that you saw on that slide. And I'm not gonna show you the fecundity and reproduction um, assays. You just have to believe me. When I tell you that Rodiola actually did well, it did well. Otherwise, this talk would be five hours if I have to show every single slide. But the big question that I get from the scientific community and colleagues is that, well, you give rhodiola rosea to a bunch of baby flies. The moment they eat clothes, you give them rhodiola rosea. We, as humans, are not going to um, take something at an infant stage. Well, we don't have to, because when we give rhodiola rosea to older flies, aged flies, rhodiola still extended the lifespan. And I'm not sure if we can say this with every single compound or extract with anti-aging claims out there. So we expose the two-week and three-week flies. So just remember that you're using J flies or the B flies from Dr. Rose's lab, and the lifespan is not really that long. They, they live up to four to six weeks, and then that's it. So three weeks is a pretty old age <laughs> for these flies. So we gave male and female rhodiola flies at various ages we gave them rhodiola rosea, and you still see an extension. So the red line is rhodiola. You still see an extension in the lifespan. Um, and then the other question was physical performance. Because what if these flies take rhodiola rosea? They live longer, and that's great. The number, the chronological age is going up, but they are very sluggish. They are not moving. You know, they are not healthy. So we did all those assays that I showed you, but we also did the physical performance. And we found that rhodiola rosea actually improves physical performance in young and old flies. So these are one, <laughs> two, three week old flies. You still see an improvement in physical performance. How do you measure fruit fly performance? <laughs> 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 we send them to a gym and we ask them to <laughs> <have a gym. laughs> and run on a trip. <laughs> one you get. So what we do is that there are these tiny little tubes. We put a, one fruit fly in those tubes and we let them walk. And then we have a laser beam that measures how many times they go back and forth. And that's physical per per performance. And you may say that, and me, the skeptic, because I have to share with you that when I saw my first rhodiola data, I was telling Dr. Ehrlich that I thought it was an error. My students made a mistake. This is impossible. So the slide that I showed you with the 25% lifespan extension, that slide, that graph has been replicated five or six times in my lab. And other people, to me, this is the beauty of this science. Other people have replicated that too. Yeah. So, because I can stand here and tell you that, oh, we have the best lab and Rhodiola is doing wonderful. But if another scientist in another country can't replicate my work, that is not science. So this is how we measure physical performance. But then I don't stop there, because you may say that the Rhodiola is a stimulant, is not improving physical, if they're just hyper, that's why they're going <laughs> back and forth. So we do, we look at the geotaxis, meaning that we look at the climbing, mm. and then Rhodiola still improves that. So I know okay. for sure that Rhodiola improves physical performance. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt. So then the next question was, so that is great. We have a plant. Rhodiola rosea, it extends the lifespan, it improves the health span. But how? How does it 
do it. <laughs> so this is the mechanism question. What is the mechanism of action of rhodiolorosia? So I am not going to show you every single slide and every single experiment that we have done, but I sh what I'm sharing with you is pretty much what we have done since 2007 with rhodiolorosia. And I'm going to show you snapshots of the mechanistic studies that we have done because again, we don't have time to cover everything. Before we do that, this is the aging pathway that we have looked at when it comes to the mechanism of fruit flies. And these aging pathways are all interrelated. So if you review the lifespan and aging literature, most of the mechanistic works is under nutrient signaling pathways. So we look at dietary restriction, because as you know, dietary restriction is the most robust intervention to increase lifespan in fruit flies, worms, mice, NIH funded a study on primates, on monkeys. The biomarkers of health were improved in that study, but the lifespan did not, um, uh, didn't increase. So the question, so now the, I guess the buzz is that dietary restriction can improve health, but that when it comes to primates, we are not gonna see an increase in lifespan, and probably in humans we don't. And we have a number of dietary restriction studies in humans, the most recent one, and the best one was you know, uh, supported by NIH, funded by NIH, and again, major improvements in the biomarkers of health, and the health span is, the lifespan is still a big question mark. So going back to these pathways, this is the insulin signaling pathway, this is the, another pathway target of rapamycin that is related to the mitochondrial and the reactive oxygen species pathway. So I look at these aging pathways that are interrelated, and I started testing if rhodiola, rhodiola rosea, targets any of these pathways. And these are some of the pathways that we looked at. We look at the silent information regulator, CIR2, which is a major pathway that falls under dietary restriction. I'm sure you've heard about resveratrol, the resveratrol story, the red wine paradox that it improves health, it increases lifespan. This is the um, protein that resveratrol works, uh, works on. And activation of this protein extends lifespan. Another robust pathway is insulin and insulin-like growth factor um, signaling and inhibition of this pathway in extends lifespan. And another commonly studied, pa studied pathway in aging is the target of rapamycin, and when we inhibit that pathway, we extend lifespan. And we also added another pathway, autophagy, which I'm going to share uh, my results with you. So we have looked at many, many different pathways from the mitochondrial oxidation, to insulin signaling, to SIR2, dietary restriction. So for the next few minutes, I'm going <coughs> to show you very briefly, I'm not going to get into much details because hopefully I'd like to have some question and answers, but if you have any question, please jump in and I'll be happy to um, answer the question. So the very first pathway that we looked at was oxidation. So I asked myself this question, is rhodiola rosea an antioxidant? And I'm not going to share my cell culture data, but we also did a very interesting cell culture study uh, with Rodiola Rosia that was also published, I think it was published around the same time, 2009. So we showed that Rodiola Rosia protects flies against oxidative stress, and it also decreases mitochondrial free radical production in fruit flies. And the, and the pathways, the mitochondrial pathways, again in fruit flies, are Conserved. So we pretty much share the same pathways with fruit flies. And then if you expose fruit flies to paraquat and you really, really stress them, you give them rhodiola rosea, the lifespan is still extended. So yes, we showed some protection when it came to oxidation and antioxidation pathways. But if you read my cell culture work, we, we don't make any definite conclusion. We don't refer to rhodiola rosea as an antioxidant because I believe the jury is still out. And again, I don't have time to show all the impact of rhodiola rosea on um, antioxidant enzymes such as superoxide, dismutase, catalase, but we do have data on those. So the next question was, is rhodiola, does rhodiola rosea work through dietary restriction? Because as I said, dietary restriction is very robust and many labs and many actually private companies are working to develop dietary restriction mimetics. And resveratrol was, uh, hoped, I would say was hoped to be one of those and we really didn't end up having subsequent you know, good data with that. 
So we ask ourselves this question that does rhodiolorosia act to dietary restriction? And we found out that dietary rhodiolorosia acts independently. So this paper was published two years ago in PLOS One, and it really created a lot of media attention. Because for the first time, or maybe one of the first times, we are showing that we have a plant, we have a botanical extract <laughs> that increases lifespan on the top of dietary restriction because we dietary restricted our flies. <laughs> so in fruit flies, they don't go through fasting. If you don't give them food, they live longer because that's dietary restriction. But of course, if you don't give them food, after a few days, they die of malnutrition <laughs> and lack of you know, calories. But we change the percentage of yeast in their diet because yeast to a fruit fly is protein. And this is how we change our, their diet. And we show that at every single yeast concentration, rhodiola still increased the lifespan. So this was a big you know, finding that the plant works independent of dietary restriction. So then we looked at, as I said, this is a very, fruit fly is a very strong genetic model. So we looked at some of the other pathways of aging. We look at target of rapamycin, insulin -like signaling, and sear twins. And you have mutant flies that are knockouts of, with this, of these proteins. And we show that rhodiola rosea again acts independently from three major aging pathways as listed here. As you can see, when you give rhodiola rosea to these mutant flies, you still see lifespan extension. And the graphs that you see on this slide, they have been um, replicated. So what we showed was that Yes, rhodiola was acts independently, but then when we looked at RNA expression of um, three drosophila insulin-like peptides, we see we saw a decrease in RNA expression. And this is something, this is what I call to be continued because we are trying to figure out why. But we showed that in DILP2 um, insulin, these are all insulin-like uh, peptides in fruit flies. So these stands for drosophila and then insulin-like peptide, two, three, five we saw a decrease in RNA expression. Then finally, this is recent, um, I would say maybe uh, six months ago, a student of mine, after we exhausted all these pathways and we still don't know how rhodiola works, she said that autophagy is an important pathway. We know that if we activate autophagy, we live longer. Autophagy is a mechanism that we are all undergoing right now that I refer to as the cleanup and recycling in our bodies. So when we have extra damaged molecules, cells, autophagy takes care of that. So autophagy, I tell my students, is the uh, garbage truck that comes over and picks up the trash can in front of homes. That's the recycling system and that's the um, cleaning system. And I'm not going to bore you with what you see here. The reason that I have this slide is to show you how complex this pathway is. So it's not that we are dealing with a couple of proteins here and there and we upregulate or downregulate them and then we are going to impact aging. It's a very complicated pathway that really controls the homeostasis <coughs> of most organisms because if you accumulate damage, what is going to, if you accumulate damaged DNA molecules, what is going to happen to us? We die very fast. And what we showed was that rhodiola rosea extends lifespan independent of autophagy. So these are the fruit flies that are mutant, we call them the ATG mutant flies. And when we give them, we gave them rhodiola, we still <coughs> observed a lifespan extension. So you're sitting there asking, what is, what is the mechanism of action of rhodiola? Mm -hmm. Right? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My hunch, and this is a hunch because we are working on this paper, and this paper will be submitted very soon. My hunch is that rhodiola rosea extends lifespan through a carbohydrate me metabolic pathway. We still don't know exactly how. We have exposed fruit flies on various diets of carbohydrates, not yeast, carbohydrates to rhodiola rosea, and we found that only in males, not in female flies. The females can be on any kind of carbohydrate diet. You give them rhodiola rosea, they extend lifespan. Isn't that great? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you take away bread from me, I will die of depression, not of anything else. But in male flies, when we gave them rhodiola rosea on a low carb diet, they, the lifespan was extended. So this work we are continuing on. We are looking at the impact of rhodiola rosea on a number of enzymes that are involved in carbohydrate metabolism. And as I'm speaking right now in my lab, 
they are looking at the impact of radial erosion on hexokinase and some of the enzymes that you see in your TCA cycle and carbohydrate metabolism. So we are hoping that we may have an answer to how rhodiola may work, but we may not. And this is really the last piece of uh, mechanistic work. A question that I sometimes get when I present is that you are a very good audience, you got convinced that uh, fruit flies are a very good model system to study aging, but sometimes some, some people are not. And they say, wait a minute, how about a rodent model? How about humans? So this study was done uh, four years ago in collaboration with a colleague of mine at NIH, Dr. Rafa Di Cabo, and we gave mice, we gave mice rhodiola rosea. This is an old mice, these are old mice, these mm -hmm. are one year old mice, and we gave them rhodiola rosea. So this is the control, this is rhodiola rosea. And what we found is that rhodiola rosea improves glucose tolerance in mice. So this is another piece of the puzzle <coughs> to make us think that maybe rhodiola rosea works through a carbohydrate met metabolic pathway. And we are including this graph because this is the only mouse study um, we ever did with rhodiola in this paper that hopefully will be submitted soon. And then you compare rhodiola rosea to everything, to all these robust uh, anti-aging uh, compounds such as rapamycin and resveratrol, because if you review the literature, if you Google rapamycin and anti-aging or resveratrol and lifespan, you see a number of publications, probably in the order of hundreds. So we compared rhodiola rosea to rapamycin and resveratrol in this graph. I mean, this is not a study. I haven't done this study. I just pulled data from other fruit fly studies. So this is not, I'm not combining worm and yeast with fruit flies. We are looking at lifespan extension in fruit flies. Rhodiola rosea improvement when it came to li lifespan was 32% compared to 6% and 29% resveratrol. So we are really talking about something that very robustly increases the lifespan across species and of course in fruit flies. So then, um, I'm sure you have seen this, a few months ago, um, this was published in Smithsonian talking about you know, Alaska and now being at the center or moving towards growing uh, rhodiola rosea and then Dr. Petra and I talk, talked about this paper and I was very excited to actually finally see Rhodiola Rosia in person and this is us yesterday. <laughs> so this is the art with um, Mr. Poindexter, this is Dr. Ilegan Me. And I can tell you how, what an experience it was for me to touch Rhodiola. I mean, I've been working with this plant for 10 years in the extract form, so I get the extract, I smell it in the lab, I saw it smells great. But there is, there is no, I mean, I, I, can, I can't really describe in words how I felt when I first touched the plant and touched the flowers. <coughs> it was really an amazing, and also the roots. So I'm really hoping that I can work more with Alaskan Grown Rhodiola Rosea. I have already started doing that work. Um, Dr. Ilik sent me a sample. So this is Alaskan Rhodiola Rosea extract that we gave to our male flies. And as you can see, the lifespan is still increased. This is the root, not the extract. And we gave them, we gave them the, I mean, this is the extract and this is the root. So I said, how about if you just give them the root? So when we gave them the root um, to males, the lifespan was extended, p-value of 0.02. In female flies, we haven't had any positive results. So we are continuing this work. I'm working with other samples that Dr. Ilay hopefully will send me soon. <laughs> and um, we are hoping that we can replicate what we have been replicated, replicated with previous rhodiola, uh, rosea extracts with the Alaskan one. But I think the, the results that you see here, statistical significant differences, is very, very promising. And what I am more excited in, I know I shouldn't be because <laughs> pharmaceutical sciences, I should go for the standard. I'm just very excited about the fact that even the root, when you, you give fruit flies the powder, the root, the powder of the root, the rhizomes of rhodiola, you still see a lifespan extension. Well, our female flies are a little bit, our female fruit flies are stubborn, so we haven't seen um, anything yet. But this is just one experiment, and we are continuing to work with Alaskan um, rhodiola rosea. So going back to this algorithm, I, if I have time, maybe I spend five minutes just telling you a little bit about these other compounds that we have worked with. Because in anti-aging research, when you see somebody who has nothing but positive results, you have to ask yourself, what is going on? I mean, why do they only have positive results? And that had not been the case 
for us because as you can see, we started with AD <laughs> compounds. And uh, we, one of the compounds that extended lifespan was pyoglitazone, so we published a paper, but I dropped the work because I decided that you can't pay me enough to take pyoglitazone to live longer with all the side effects that the uh, drug comes in with. So we mostly work with plants. And when people ask me, how did, you, how did you end up working with rhodiola so much? I say, I didn't really choose that. My fruit flies directed me to, towards rhodiola rosea because we had such amazing results. So one of the plants we worked with with good results was Rosa d'Alessena. It's a rose species that is very fragrant. Mm -hmm. Most of the um, rose that you uh, smell in perfumes, rose perfumes come from this species. It's very expensive. I was told that a few milligrams of the oil is sold for a couple of thousand dollars. So it's a, it's a pretty expensive um, uh, plant. And these are some of the putative active compounds that we try to standardize our rose species. And we found out that Rhodiola rosea extends the lifespan in fruit flies, but it decreases the heat shock protein expression. So what that means is that if you take Rhodiola rosea and you go to Sahara, you probably die really fast <laughs> because your heat shock protein expressions are uh, um, decreased. Another um, botanical extract that we worked with was curcumin, which is the act really is not a botanical extract, it's the active compound in turmeric. So it's a spice that is used in various cuisines around the world uh, as a spice, as a food ingredient. And we showed that curcumin increases the lifespan of male flies, not female flies in this species. And then in my lab, so this was the work that was done actually in my lab. And then we had a collaborator in Korea who looked at the impact of curcumin on lifespan and he showed that curcumin in his species, he used not my flies, Canton S flies, he had the opposite results. Mm -hmm. So the curcumin increased lifespan in females and not males. And something that I failed to mention is that in fruit flies you see a lot of sex specificity, meaning that you may see lifespan extension in males and not females, you may see a decrease in reproduction in females and not males, and um, <coughs> And we are trying to figure out with the plants and extracts that we work with, we are trying to keep it very universal because we don't want to just extend lifespan in guys, <laughs> in men. We want well, to expand yes lifespan. Yes, we do. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> just for them. Yeah, okay. Um, and then another um, spice, we, we just published this paper last year on cinnamon. Cinnamon has anti-aging properties, so we were able to show that in a very beautiful way. I'm very proud of this graph because cinnamon extended the lifespan of male and female flies. And also another white type of flies, that 1118, both males and females. And it also improved uh, physical performance. So everything else that I've been talking about, the curcumin and Rosa damascena also went through that algorithm. So you just have to believe me that it, they all improved the health span. And what was very interesting with cinnamon, the, the anti-aging was interesting, we, we were very excited, but an incidental finding that I wasn't really looking for, we were trying to find out how cinnamon works. So we exposed fruit flies to heat, and then we measured their heat shock proteins. And we found out that cinnamon actually sensitizes flies to heat, protects them against cold, and elevates heat shock protein 70. Um, I don't know if you, grew up with that or if in the cultures that you come from, if cinnamon has ever been promoted to be used during winter time to keep your body warm. I had a grandmother who used to force me to have a very bad tasting tablespoon of cinnamon every morning during the harsh winters in Tehran. And I used to really dislike that. I used to say, Grandma, this is voodoo medicine. She said, no, you don't understand. This is going to keep you warm. Mm -hmm. And I would say, my jacket is going to keep me warm. <laughs> <laughs> And years later, years and years later, here's the science mm -hmm. that my grandmother was right. Cinnamon does work on heat shock proteins, and that's probably why it has thermogenic properties that it and it decreases the body temperature. And then green tea was is the last um, extract that I'm going to talk about. So we were we were able to show that green tea extends the lifespan of males, again not females, mm -hmm. males. 
And it doesn't extend the lifespan of any kind of males. It only extends the lifespan of males who hang out with females. <laughs> so this <laughs> is a really bad idea. <laughs> to drink tea with another guy. There should be a woman here. <laughs> bad idea. So I didn't really believe this data, and we, we repeated it, and that's what we found out. That when male flies are housed separately and we give them green tea, their lifespan doesn't go up. They have to hang out with female flies. And so what does this say about marriage? <laughs> it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Drink more green tea. But wait, wait. So we went through this algorithm with green tea because we were excited. It increases <laughs> the lifespan. Oh, fantastic. Here's another anti-aging compound. So it was about three years ago that um, I had a new graduate student, Terry Lopez. And we found out that green tea increases the lifespan but it really impacts the reproduction of male flies, not female flies. No impact on fecundity of female flies, but male flies. We showed that green tea actually decreases male fertility. And we continued the work. We looked at the uh, different doses of green tea, and we found out that if you expose fruit flies to high doses of green tea, in this case 10 mg per ml, you are going to delay pup development and pupation and decrease their weight. So my students look at the size of the fruit fly. So this is, uh, these are female and these are male control. And these are female flies exposed to green tea. So just compare the size. And this is a male fly exposed to green tea. Terry took one step further and she looked at the morphology of the sex organs, of the testes and ovaries in fruit flies. I know some of you are like, what? <laughs> they, do <laughs> have, <laughs> they do have ovaries and they do have testes. So this is a normal male testes in a fruit fly. So you see axillary glands, um, you see everything. And the testes are right here. When you give them green tea, they disappear. So morpholo major morphological changes in male fruit flies. <laughs> I know. This is real. This is not a joke. <laughs> we took these pictures. I took this picture. And in a female fly, this is a normal ovary. You have the eggs. Unfortunately, for the lighting, you can't see the ovarials. So the ovarials are full of eggs in a female ovary. And then we expose them to green tea. Look what happens. They are smaller and um, different morphological changes. So Terry is uh, working on two papers with the green tea data. And our hope is to also educate the community that not everything that extends the lifespan is good for you. Maybe it's extending the lifespan at the price of something. And it di in this case, is the reproduction and the development and the pupation. So just to summarize, again, um, this is our research. We have been evaluating the mechanism of action of everything that I've been talking about. More importantly, rhodiola rosea, because this is still like a big mystery for us. But hopefully by the time we are done with our carbohydrate metabolism paper, we have a better answer. Maybe I should come back here next year and show you some really good data with carbohydrate metabolism. But we are right now in the process of identifying active compounds, more specifically, more specifically, again, with rhodiola rosea, because as a pharmaceutical scientist, I want to know which molecule is doing what. <laughs> but I tell you that I have done lifespan studies with individual compounds. And yes, we saw some lifespan extension. But when you give them the full extract, you get 25% increase in lifespan. So to me, these compounds work in synergism to give you the health benefit and the lifespan extension that you see with rhodiola rosea. And in my mind, it's a very narrow-minded approach to research. I call it the Western approach, to dissect the plant out and say which molecule is doing what. Because rhodiola rosea, as a whole, is doing what I have been showing you in the past uh, 45 minutes. So as far as the clinical application goes, we do have a number of papers in the literature on therapeutic benefits um, with rhodiola rosea. And probably, if I were going to rank the top three indications that many psychiatrists, integrative medicine psychiatrists, and naturopaths are using rhodiola is for anxiety, mild depression. I have a few friends, psychiatrist friends, who have started using rhodiola extensively in their kids with ADD and physical performance. Um, my friends, I have two friends who take rhodiola rosea for cognition. And they say that if we stop taking the extract, we forget things. 
Am I going to endorse any of that? Yes and no, because I haven't done the research and I think we still have a long way to go. But the evidence is there. I mean, we have a number of publications. I've, I've listed a few here. This is for FETI, and this is um, SHR5 is the Swedish Herbal Institute extract that, that is standardized always to 3% and 2% rosevin, 1% salidrosyl, and it improves the capacity for metal work. And if you review the literature, you see many, many more clinical studies. I try to find out when the first reports of clinical studies with Rodiola were published, and this is what I found in 1987. It was a book chapter in a book in Russian that was published in, in Russia. So I'm going to end my talk by, by acknowledging the people who did the work. <coughs> I come here and present the work, uh, but really working with fruit flies is very labor intensive and time consuming. So the undergrad students that you <coughs> see in these slides did most of the work. My graduate student, Terry's focus is on green tea, and then Dr. Schreiner, uh, my former project scientist, did most of the mechanistic work that I presented, working with the mutant flies, and uh, his specialty is mitochondrial bioenergetics, so he did, uh, he did that work too. And my finding comes from NIH and mm -hmm. also a grant from UCI, so I'd like to thank them. And we've had collaborators pretty much all over. <laughs> for the work that we've done, and my hope is to have collaborators now in Alaska, and we have already started the work with um, Dr. Ely. So I end my talk, again, going back to my grandmother, <laughs> 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 that I do aging research, but according to her, she was always 20 years younger than what everybody else thought. So I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yeah.